that the microphone is working. Good morning. I would like to say good morning to everyone that I haven't yet met, as well as those whom I have met. So everything is working. I am aware of the fact that this title may sound a bit odd, but generally so many things may sound odd. Why not the title of a presentation? I'll explain why I chose this title. And my presentation will consist of four parts. Number one, my name is Przemysław Staroń, and I'm, first of all, a teacher. So whenever people ask me, I say, I'm a psychologist, I'm a cultural expert, and a scientist, and a teacher. And this makes me very happy, being a teacher. Sometimes or often people make a link between myself and Harry Potter. Why this happens, I have no idea. But definitely, I am head of the Phoenix uh, Order, or the Order of Phoenix, where I teach philosophy to a multi-age group, especially that when you use, well, I use social media in my teaching, so I have discovered Snapchat. It's, it was at one point hugely popular. And when I started using Snapchat, they called me Professor Snap. So if you type in Przemek Staroń in any, anywhere online, you'll find something about me. If you're, interest, if you're interested, check me out. But I'm not going to talk too much about myself, only uh, as much as it helps me explain what I'm talking about here. So I treat social media and new technology as a tool, as a part of my work. So when I create a tableau for my group uh, and I present them in the form of Lego, uh, little Lego figurines, it's nice. But sometimes I don't use technology at all. And sometimes I do. But sometimes I simply use my personality as a tool. So also, as I said, I'm not a mad scientist or something. I mean, maybe I am, but I'm a scientist. And that's the important thing. Whatever I do is based on science and based on empirical data. Not only um, human uh, or sort of sciences uh, and humanities, but also other sciences. So, but first of all, I'm a teacher. So when I was developing my teaching career, there is an exam that I had to take. And I talked about me as a psychologist and so on. And someone asked me, do you have any measurable results in your work? And I said, measurable? Yeah, OK. In the last five years, kids got 27 titles and uh, honors in all sorts of uh, competitions at a very high level, even though our school normally is not specialized in sciences. So it's measurable. I'm getting results. Number two, second part of my presentation. I've noticed at one point when I started out uh, using with using social media, and then I was being reported by fellow teachers that I was communicated with communicating with kids on Facebook. I was getting reported. I guess everyone knows that social media are everywhere. No, it's really not true. Some people have no idea. Like one of, uh, one of the um, uh, students asked me, why did you put ZW, which means be back soon in Polish? And I said, no, no be back soon. I, it means excused at school. So it was a, just a brief. Uh, encounter and uh, a challenge sort of what kids think and how we interpret certain things. But let's look at this. Some adults make this mistake. Like, for example, if you remember about Einstein, he put everything upside down, right? Everything that people had believed. So physicists who were crazy about Newton, they felt like everything is right. Everything falls into place apart from Mercury because its orbit, it's sort of, it's not heeding what Newton uh, is saying. And everyone said, oh, let's leave it. Doesn't matter. But Einstein thought differently. It may not be a mistake. Maybe it's something else. Maybe we're dealing with a completely different reality and our patterns and our theories are wrong. So he didn't say, let's fit, let's make sure reality fits 
our vision. He said the other way around. Let's make our vision fit what's out there. And then when Einstein was done with it, it turned out that gravitation or gravity was not a force, but it was something to do with time and space. And then everything fit somehow. But still, I feel that we still have this problem that we're trying to make facts fit our vision rather than the other way around. But fortunately, people like us in a place like here, I know that I'm moving around so much, maybe the cameraman has a hard time of it, but still, people cannot function without mobile devices and social, uh, social um, media. Yes, kids, just like Mark Pransky said, are not human beings like us. They are different, and the reality is different. Take pictures because it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, image. I know plenty of teachers. I also belong to a special uh, teaching community group, Super Belfry. They are absolutely at home and absolutely tech savvy and at home with technology. So sometimes technology helps us uh, say things that cannot be said otherwise. But still, it's just half of the problem. Half is solved, but there is the other half. Lots of people already agreed. Young people are digital natives. They live in the mobile devices world, but they are also exposed to so many threats. It's so terrible and dangerous. And I'm saying to this, sure, you're right. Yeah, uh, I use social media a lot also for research as I work, right? I know that it may seem this way. Social media sometimes, for example, serve the purpose of creating someone's false image, right? But if we stop at this and say social media and the internet are bad, that's not so good. So third part of my presentation, it's just like with the strings theory. The strings theory is right now sort of aspiring to be the so-called theory of everything sort of putting everything in place or into place. But some people believe that talking about astrophysicists and the strings theory is very difficult because it's very difficult to express in natural language. It can only be expressed in equations. But let me try. So at one point, we just stopped. At first, we stopped like there's atoms, then electrons, then quarks. But now it turns out there's something more outside of time and space, something multidimensional, the so-called strings. And this theory resonates with me a lot because it serves to show us something that we always or often fail to see what's beyond, what's out there, like beyond the superficial thing. And then when we look at what's beyond all the dangers of the internet, it's only the tip of the iceberg. Think about Titanic. It hit only the tip of the iceberg. So what about kids? Kids, when they function, they see only the surface. If it's nasty, it means it feels bad, for example. But actually, when you communicate with human beings, whatever age, you have to look beyond, look at the so-called strings, read between the lines, because this is where true messages lie. The internet is not the problem. The problem is our, not our like we in this room, but our like human. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of speaking on behalf of the human race, the whole humanity. Nice, huh? So anyway, Czesław Miłosz, our Polish Nobel Prize winner, he wrote, if we were looking better and smarter at things, we would see more stars and more flowers out there in this world. So let's look at things better. Let's look at them smarter. Because what the internet has brought about, it hasn't really brought about new problems. Technically speaking, yeah. Technologically speaking, yeah. But actually, it uncovered some of the problems that we hadn't been dealing with for years, rather than new problems. So let me stress this. We have to look between the lines, beyond what's there. 
I'm teaching also ethics and philosophy. And when a journalist asks me about this Z generation, uh, the zillennials, are they deaf to meaningful relationships? No, they're not. They're asking, what's the point in that? So when you are a teenager, when you're growing up, when you're asking about the meaning of life, it's a developmental phase, whatever generation you're in. So don't treat young people as people who are deaf to whatever profound there is in the world. No, let's read between the lines because this is what they do. This is what my um, student did one point, at one point, uh, and he said, when you say, wow, this is cool, we like it. But when you share students' work on Facebook, you share it, it's even better than you saying, wow. So what does that mean? Do they like me, like it when I share their work on Facebook? Maybe yes, but it tells me even more. When I'm skillful at social media, I can stimulate kids and their self-esteem in a meaningful way. Oh, I remember some of the kids had switched all their profile photos to my photo, to my portrait photo. And I could say, oh, it's so cool, they like me, and so on. I'm proud. I'm touched. But it doesn't matter at this point in time, because at this meta level, what means is they felt I was their leader. They felt I was their leader, and they felt it was appropriate for them to thank me for being their leader. I love the latest technology. I love social media. We have the Order of Phoenix, right? We're on Facebook. I love infographics, all sorts of learning techniques and methodologies. I know how you can harness technology to help you learn. I love memes, right? Uh, all the class on Immanuel Kant has to show this. This card, you have to show this, right? Why not? But people ask me sometimes, do you have any fuck ups? Do you ever screw something up? Yes. I remember that one of my students in a competition, she wrote non cogito ergo yolo. And then at the last moment, oh, no, it was a meme. It was not what he said. Right? But still, kids are crazy about memes, and so I used it in a meaningful way. And I'm not saying, look, philosophy, it's serious business, don't laugh. No, I'm just wondering what language to use to talk to them about philosophy. And I got something from my student. If I can't śmieszk, it's not my revolution. It's like, if I'm not laughing at this, it's not for me. If it doesn't make me laugh, it's not my thing. And this is how you should do it. Some people say, can you even do it? Sure you can. At one point, uh, my students told me that maybe I should use Snapchat. Snapchat is so cool, so young, so hip. I was afraid that I would make a fool of myself, but no, it didn't. Yeah, age is nothing but a number. Uh, so I started teaching kids about philosophy through Snapchat. I sort of entered their digital jungle in order to teach them about philosophy. I have always loved ethnographic research. It was really great because I was asking them questions. Then they responded with some problems that I was supposed to solve, like this water uh, and how water was the beginning of the world and so on and so on. And then they started sharing on Snapchat some of what we did in class together. I love Lego blocks as well. We had some medieval philosophy classes. Anyone who had philosophy in university, medieval philosophy is like the most boring thing ever. But look what my students did. At 38 Snapchats, 38 pieces of proof, uh, like St. Thomas, St. Anselmus, that God existed. And then he said, no, there is no clear answer to that. But anyway, this is a typical example. We talk about Descartes. At one point, Descartes died because his immunity and immune system was down. 
So this was what my student said. I'm not going to get up too early because this is what this card was doing. And then his immune system was down and then he died. So she tried to explain why he was not up, why she was not up early. Look, Snapchat uh, can help kids communicate very serious and profound things. Henri Bergson, a Nobel Prize winner, a great philosopher who said that fundamental and big things can be also discussed in a lightweight tone, but profound nonetheless. Like these are Snapchats from my students who are shopping and they see a brand called Avicenna, but they remember that there was an Arab philosopher with this name. It sounds funny, but um, at one point uh, uh, my students were saying about me that I was a cool teacher or the cool teacher because I was using Snapchat. But there's more to that. There's something more profound to that. And I've discovered that Snapchat was something activated when kids needed support, like, for example, when we were doing the philosophy competition and when they needed support, they sent me messages on Snapchat. So I always helped them, responded to that. And then I thought as a researcher, what's behind it? What's behind the snaps and my communication with my students? It's not only about me being a hip and cool teacher, no but it was about being them feeling that I was with them every step of the way. It's not like you're going to uh, start your Snapchat accounts and you'll be uh, like me. It's also about your personality. It's about what suits you. If you prefer to be with your student every step of the way using a stone uh, table, then do that. So. Sometimes kids go to the teacher's room and when they need help, they ask for you and you're not there. But sometimes kids need you to be with them instantly. So when I, for example, teach about Leibniz, the philosopher, of course, I bring the cookies and they love it. But I try to look beyond. I try to dig deeper. It's not only about them using Snapchat, but it's about them being on fire intellectually. Whenever they find Leibniz, when they go on holiday, they send me a message saying, we remember about your lesson. We remember about that class. It's about them being passionate and letting me know. So I started following this line of thinking and wondering what's important for them, what stimulates them. Snapchat is anonymous. Like, for example, some of my students may say, I was kissing uh, someone at a party. Can I get HIV infected? It's easier for them to ask this question on Snapchat, knowing that it will disappear at one point rather than on Facebook, because there's anonymity. Like, for example, a kid uh, writes, we're going to leave the cave or then they uh, message me when I'm on sick leave. When are you back? Then I think it's not just them trying to suck up to me. I think we've built a relationship. So again, let me go back to the strengths theory. There is so much more beyond, deeper, beneath what we see. So we can fight all the evil of the internet. But why? Should we even fight? I mean, that's another story. Should we fight with what, with all the problems beneath instead, maybe? Look, this is what they wrote. We have a tombstone for you in the Warsaw Powonski Cemetery. So yeah, a joke. I don't know who destroyed our minds by saying that if we have a laugh together with our students, then we're not good teachers, that, that we're not teaching them anything. No, it's not true. So this snap re reminds me that they found a pretty nice grave for me. Uh, so I need someone to continue my work when I die. 
the Order of the Phoenix, the organization that I run, may uh, may make you think of lots of things. But actually, what I mean by this is a lot of multi-generational relationships. Some people ask me, why do you use senior citizens? I don't use them. They want to do this. And older people, senior citizens, what they say is, why is it so late in life when I when I reached the age of 70 that I can not give a rat's ass about what people think of me? They say, if you if, if someone tells them that you shouldn't be doing that because it's unbecoming, they say there's no such thing. So they don't have they don't care about their image. They don't have to they they just don't give a shit about what people think of them. We sometimes strike different poses in social media. But older people they are simply total in their being in the moment with those young kids, doing things together, Some, something that parents sometimes cannot do. For those kids, these relationships are really important. It's not like I told them to look at, look at the camera, strike a pose, because I'm, I'm going to show it at a conference. No, sort of being authentic being true to yourself. This is exactly what they're doing. Uh, there was this woman, Dana, who had breast cancer. Like uh, someone said, oh, she's going to be boring at one point. But actually, she had always been well liked. And then when she got breast cancer, kids started sharing their duties so that they can come and visit her, do shopping for her, and so on. And at one point, she said, I might die. And one guy said, no, you cannot. If you even try and die, you know what? I'm, we're going to kick your coffin, and you'll have to get up. Don't even try. And then some said, OK, I'm going to join you. So yeah, they are serious when they say that. And it's not just happening in those nice pictures. It's happening in our school. Go to that uh, video. It's called The Help. And look at this relationship that this little white girl had had with her black nanny. And if you think about even your grandparents, I'm sure you've met in your life an elderly person who had showed you how to be, how to be you. So when someone asks me, how come your students are so successful in different competitions? Because, for example, when they go to the highest level of the competition, to the finals, and they come to Warsaw, their elderly friends come with them to kick their asses if they, have, uh, if they feel stressed or nervous. So before the holiday season, we were looking for a bone marrow donor for a colleague uh, she unfortunately died before we found a donor, but still, students said, looking for the donor, it's great to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Like here, it's something about a police, uh, a policeman that got into a conflict with an order, and by order they mean our order of the phoenix. So. Kids really need something that's bigger than themselves. Read Campbell, and then you'll know about why we have fundamentalism, why we have fascism on the rise in Poland. Because if you deprive human beings of myths, of things that are greater than themselves, that they can be part of, they will submerge, they will submerge in something usually negative and counterproductive. I'd say evil can be really effective and appealing, unfortunately. So let me say, I love the internet. I really appreciate it. Uh, but actually, uh, our, oh, this is Grandma Bogusia, who became a great star of YouTube. Dana, the one I told you about, uh, this is her. Or Krisha, she started using Snapchat. 
even though she calls it schnapps, but whatever, you can see. So anyway, I remember what one of my students sent me. Uh, Przemek is my philosophical master of the shit book. So anyway, Facebook will be there. The internet will be there. So it's not going away. You have to be able to be there and be with the kids every step of the way. If the child writes uh, that I'm the philosophical master of shit book, it's exactly what they want to hear. That's what they want to promote. So my message is simply be. Uh, let me just uh, briefly say, ladies and gentlemen, if you truly want internet not to be a risk and threat, please uh, fill up the uh, young people's lives with uh, positive things. Uh, one of the heroes of uh, Harry Potter said one beautiful sentence, it's a beautiful place that I can be with my friends. So if you think why people, why children go to internet, uh, maybe because they find uh, um, the uh, bit of friendship there. Uh, who shall be their friends? Actually, teachers who have to actually uh, follow the educational reform, structural changes that do not bring anything at the level of human being. Parents who have to actually um, work uh, in three shifts, and you know, children have to find place where they can be, simply be, and they find this place in internet. So what about my, I'd like to urge you, let's create this space. And uh, I'm a big fan of legal blogs. I remember there was a, um, a father who asked me, uh, what should we do actually if you have a box uh, of sand? And uh, so what can you do to stop people adding things to this box? Uh, you can warn it. You can, uh, you can uh, control it. But if and then he said, well, if this box is already filled up and full, then no one is actually going to add anything on top of it. So if the uh, heads of young people are empty, everything will get into it. But if you fill it up with solidarity, friendship, support, positive uh, uh, things and uh, then believe uh, or not the problem, the issue of uh, safety online will be uh, the last problem we'll have to solve. Maybe I'm uh, just the idealist, but uh, well, let's do things together. Let's uh, uh, be together. Let's care for ourselves because you won't be able to help the others if you do not care for yourself. And that, that's why I'm always saying to be an effective ed educator, I, I have to care for myself. I have to uh, have a healthy lifestyle, eat good, uh, stop smoking. I have to be mentally healthy. You have to be strong simply to give to empower the others. And I want to urge be um, uh, the researchers try to research. I really like Jonathan's uh, presentation when he was really mentioning naming all the things which are so fundamental when we talk about teaching. Do you know how much time I spent on fake news lessons? One lesson per year because other lessons we talk about uh, critical thinking. So when we talk about fake news, kids tell me what for? We know it already. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get uh, friends with the theory of strings and well uh, we should be able to see uh, to what to, to to look and see things that uh, um, to see things which are uh, invisible and uh, if uh, you want to contact me um, you can uh, write me email uh, so Let's stay in contact. Thank you very much.